So uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, fiber diffraction. In fact, I started off life in fiber diffraction um, as, as for my PhD, I, I, I did fiber diffraction stuff on, on DNA, in fact, because uh, my, my supervisor at the time was a guy called Watson Fuller, who did his PhD with Morris Wilkins, who of course was one of the three people implicated, or four people implicated in the, uh, in, the, the, in the DNA story at King's and at Cambridge. So uh, I, I was doing, um, I started off doing uh, fiber diffraction on DNA samples, uh, looking at DNA polymorphism, because DNA is not just your standard double helix, which uh, stays in one form, it changes between different forms uh, depending on um, the sequence in it and depending on the environment, the water content, the ionic strength. So I thought this was very interesting because uh, obviously there was a, 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 a temptation to, and I'm sure it's true in one way or another, um, temptation to think that these different forms of DNA had um, uh, biological function. And I'm, I'm sure that that is true, but it has never really been worked out. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I'll try to give you a feeling for uh, some of that, uh, how we used x-rays to look at things changing, looking at DNA changing from one thing to another, uh, and uh, looking at using the neutrons to look at the water around it, and uh, uh, which of course was one of the things that made it change, one of the uh, things that drove transitions between different forms of DNA. But just to take you back to, oh gosh, right now I have no idea why. Oh, here we are. Right, so fiber diffraction is all about filamentous molecules. So this is tobacco mosaic virus. It was one of the most famous uh, cases of uh, fiber diffraction, I guess it, 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 it was, um, you know, that's an electron micrograph obviously, and uh, but there was a lot of interest in, 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 in tobacco mosaic virus for its helical structure and for, um, uh, for the amazing data that it gave. Uh, and uh, amyloid fibers, many of you will know about amyloid fibers. They're, they're a hot topic in many ways. Uh, depositions that are deeply associated with um, uh, particular pathologies. Uh, so very important in terms of our uh, increasing lifespans and uh, uh, you know, different types of pathologies associated with longer lifetimes. Um, PF1 is a filamentous phage, um, uh, bacteriophage, uh, and these are just examples. This is the DNA protein complex. In fact, it's a DNA, it's a picture I took ages ago of DNA complex to a rec, the RecA protein, which is involved in genetic recombination. And there's DNA itself. You can see it there. You can see in places where it's you know, the double-stranded stuff has, 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 um, is, uh, becomes uh, single-stranded in places and looped out. Uh, so filamentous molecules. Now, the key thing about filamentous molecules is, is that if you uh, imagine, I don't know, a bowl of spaghetti, let's just say you have a bowl of spaghetti, you've made a bowl of spaghetti, and you're, you put your hands into it and you pull the spaghetti, then what you see is that all the spaghetti between your two hands will line up, right? Now that's not crystallization, of course, but it's increased order. So you've lined up all the molecules uh, parallel and you've introduced an order uh, uh, in, along the length of the alignment uh, and which about that axis, it's randomly oriented, right? So that's what you could call cylindrical averaging, right? Um, so you've gone from a completely disordered state to one where you have partial ordering in one direction, right? So that's what, in a nutshell, what fiber diffraction is. You've got to persuade your filamentous molecules, which don't crystallize and never will crystallize probably. Um, uh, you've got to persuade them to, to line up if you want to move from a completely disordered diffraction data set to one where we have partial ordering and where you can get more, um, more precise information, perhaps about the helical symmetry, but in the most favorable situation where you can get um, data that give you analyzable quality um, results and molecular modeling potential. Sometimes uh, it's just that when you 
you know, there, so you can actually do parametric studies. You can watch transitions, as I was saying, you can watch things happening. Um, uh, and you have all sorts of possibilities for for um, for doing particular things. And, and in fact, I just recently uh, collected a, a data set with Marion across the road, across just opposite from my office, um, who where uh, we were looking at amyloid filaments, and we were basically passing uh, uh, amyloid filaments from a tube through a capillary, uh, which was in the beam, in the X-ray beam, and. Uh, and as they pass through the capillary, they line up, and then you can get diffraction quality data. I've, I've, this, the, those pictures are not actually in this uh, in this uh, presentation, but I, at a push, I could try to find them. Um, anyway, so so uh, lots of interesting th systems, n n not the level of crystallographic ordering that that uh, the crystallographers uh, like to see, but nonetheless. Um, highly relevant to some of the most interesting systems um, you could imagine. Um, and this, of course, is a famous picture. Um, and, and it's probably the most famous example of, of fiber diffraction. And, um, and the consequences of this structure determination have been incalculable, as well as controversial in all sorts of different ways. Um, but in that picture, you see Watson and Crick, you see their model, which was made of wire, right? It was a wire metal model. Uh, you can see along the outside, um, the, uh, can you see my cursor? No, yes, can you see yes. my cursor? Yes. Okay, great. So along the outside, you can see the sugar, uh, those five membered rings, that's the sugar group, and then the you know, successive sugar groups that phosphates in between them. And then in the middle, uh, with retort stands, uh, old style retort stands, uh, dimensioned and positioned such as they represent the base pairs uh, uh, going vertically upwards in that picture. So that's the model. And of course, we all know uh, about that in, in different ways. Um, if you actually, I, I, I think this is just, I don't know, this is probably a bit simplistic because I know you guys have you've probably got lots of experience of, of diffraction, but I always like to show this because it, it was just, it's one of the things I found as a, a very interesting little teaching aid. Um, but if you take this, this picture actually came from the original Watson Crick paper, uh, which uh, in fact was, uh, I believe, uh, an appendix, a one page appendix in Crick's thesis. Uh, so he had all of his uh, other stuff, his human, whatever it was, Ox, ox, oxygenate hemoglobin and, and then a head of the one page uh, appendix at the end, which was the structure of DNA. So that's 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 sort of quite amazing. But uh, this is the picture uh, from that Nature paper, I think it was there. Uh, and um, that's how it's represented, a, a double ribbon with a base going between the two things. It was stereochemically, it was miles off. It was, it, it was Angstrom's off. Uh, but it was right conceptually, and um, and then the the consequences for for replication, storage, transcription, and so on were all very much uh, evident from from this simple model. Um, so, uh, but if you think about that, uh, you know, you could think of DNA if you just break it up uh, uh, into components, perhaps, uh, and you think of it uh, as how many of you have, have ever done a single slit experiment with a laser? Anybody? Anybody? One person there? Okay, so that's a few people there. So, so it's a very simple thing you can do. You can get a laser that you use to demonstrate to use in a, in a lecture theater, and you can take a single slit, you can put the laser through it, and you will see spots in a line across the screen. Um, and, and that's the diffraction pattern of a single slit. And for the physicists amongst you, uh, uh, you will have probably done this at school, done the experiment to measure the size of the slit and the variation of the pattern and this type of thing. And so I'm, what I'm, I'm just saying here is that look at this double helix and just think of it <coughs> as a set of slits in this direction. So that set of slits there. Uh, and think of another set of slits, which is like in the background of this picture, uh, which would be perhaps like that. Just think of that as a, in a simple, very simplistic way. I mean, obviously, uh, it's it, they're not evenly spaced. There's all sorts of different things going on there, uh, and uh, so you can sort of think of assembling the object like that. Um, 
So if my slides are in one piece, um, then what you could do is say, well, let's consider the diffraction pattern of the red one on the second diagram on, from the left and think what would that diffraction pattern be like? So a single slit diffraction pattern, as I was just saying from a laser, this is what you, you'd have your laser, you have a slit, you have a screen, and that's what it looks like on the right. And you know you can adjust that. That pattern will change depending on what the slit dimension is, also on, on what the screen dimension is, or screen distance is, um, and so on. So that's what it looks like, single slit diffraction pattern. And um, if you just consider this first part <coughs> as a as a single slit, or a set of slits rather, uh, which is more like grating really, um, then uh, you might expect something like that, um, perpendicular to the slit. Uh, a set of spots like that. And if you consider the second one, you might. Right. So um, that's just, it's an aid to teaching and it's just meant to, to illustrate that you don't have to get into the analytics of diffraction in order to, to exploit it, or, or, or even for that matter, to understand it in too much detail. Uh, because in the end, this is the real DNA, as it were, or space filling model. Those are the sort of slit concepts built into it. And that's what the diffraction pattern looks like there. So the, that's the classic X-shaped diffraction pattern. I'll go into this uh, in a little bit more detail, for, but for those of you who haven't don't do physics or don't haven't done math or whatever don't worry about it you can forget about it because uh uh i always think you should be able to understand and explain these things without without a single equation but i have got lots of equations later so um but gloss over them if it's not your thing because it, it's uh it, what's more interesting behind all of this is, is the, sort of the implications for biology so uh if you look at that that's the x-shaped pattern uh, that corresponds to if you like the sort of backbones and this simple simple model, and then of course perpendicular to that, you've got the bases going across, and that's another periodicity there. So that vertical periodicity in the case of of the B form of DNA is uh, is that these black lines here, the base bases base pairs stacking one on top of the other, and uh, so you've got uh, another periodicity which which turns up at the top of this diffraction pattern, and that is in the case of B DNA, the pitch of the helix. Is, a, is about 34 angstroms. There's 10 base pairs in one turn, and the separation, of course, between base pairs is about 3.4 angstroms. And those, in, in that very simple way of looking at this classical, we took this diffraction pattern off uh, Darsbury, I think it's one of the Darsbury Laboratory, one of the first experiments we did at Darsbury Laboratory, which no longer exists. Um, but uh, it's a very, um, it's a very, um, it's iconic, this type of diffraction pattern. And um, so what got me interested in in, um, in in the DNA was the fact that, I mean, this this was all sort of known, that, that there's, there was the excitement of, the, when I started in my PhD, the excitement of, of the fiber diffraction stuff and the, and the DNA structure uh, was still there, but it was sort of dying off and, and, and people were moving to single crystal studies of oligonucleotides, which uh, were very interesting as well. Um, but of course, they, they weren't uh, studies that related to the long polymeric molecule, which is what you actually see in, in, in what you, you get in, in real real life. But nonetheless, they, they have their place in things. And um, so uh, I don't know why I come back to this slide. Um, but to, just to summarize, um, it's uh, uh, the, the fiber diffraction, it's applied to, um, it's a natural one for molecules that uh, assume uh, helical conformations rather than the globular structures of many proteins. Uh, um, and while they won't crystallize, they, they, it, very often they can be persuaded to line up parallel to each other, which gives you the option of producing data, which cannot be analyzed in the same way, but uh, nevertheless, it gives you data that may be the only way you get uh, usable data and can give you important uh, insight. Now, I, I mentioned spaghetti, um, uh, and here's the molecular spaghetti I was talking about, uh, all in different ways. Uh, whoops. Uh, so if you imagine the first picture on the top here, uh, that these two things on the left and on the right, 
um, those are glass rods. So there's a, basically imagine a, a, a very thin glass rod that you've drawn in a frame uh, and you take, you, you take two pieces of it and, and you, but you put uh, the tip into a flame and then you make a little bead at the end of one, of one big little glass rod and, and you make another same thing for the other. So you have this sort of sphere, uh, which is good for uh, a surface tension of the liquid you, you drop out. And basically you set those up in a little jig and you put a drop of your DNA solution, if it's DNA, um, onto it, and uh, and then it dries down. So you, if you can imagine, I should have had a picture of it really, but anyway, if you imagine a drop going between there, quite big at the beginning, and uh, and then as it dries down, you pull the glass rods away from each other, and this is you and your hands pulling the spaghetti um, parallel to each other as it as it dries down, as the concentration goes up. And then finally, uh, when it's dried and all the liquid has, has evaporated, you cut it in the middle and you've got two samples. Uh, so that's what you see there, that's DNA. This is uh, a different way of lining up. Um, this is TMV, tobacco mosaic virus. It, the, here, this is what was called a sol sample and it's where you get your concentrated uh, virus sample and you literally flow it up and down in this capillary and as you flow it, it aligns. It's a sheer, sheer alignment. It needs to have a certain concentration. It needs all sorts of particular, particular conditions. And you can, you can see it, watch it line up. You can see by refringence and so on. Uh, and, you can, and, and you can characterize. And that, that, that is outstandingly successful. It's used for many filamentous virus samples uh, um, uh, and, uh, and different types of systems. And at the bottom, I sort of show you the comparison uh, top X-ray world, bottom neutron world samples, big samples, small samples. So what have we done in the bottom? Uh, we've basically made uh, made um, several or many, uh, sometimes hundreds of DNA, individual DNA samples and assemble them to make a sample that's uh, suitable for neutron work, big enough uh, to get a diffraction pattern from a neutron source. So several things there, all based around molecular alignment uh, and, uh, and, and um, relevant to a whole range of different systems. Cellulose is another one, uh, you know, the most abundant polymer on, in, on Earth, apparently. Uh, I can believe it as well. Um, and uh, so cellulose is another good example. We've done lots of work on cellulose. Uh, now, so, uh, so uh, just to sort of um, put that in context, uh, the, the the application is is fairly broad, uh, and it's not just the biological molecules I've mentioned. Um, it, it, there's many biological examples. Uh, collagen, there you go, another one, hugely important molecule for connective tissue and so on. Uh, but also, there's a lot of synthetic polymers uh, and um, a huge range of, of interest there. We're surrounded by polymers in lots of, in lots of ways. Polymers are you know, in our modern world are plaguing us. Uh, it's all over the place, it's in the sea, it's inside animals, it's everywhere. So um, for, for good reasons or bad, polymers are, are, are very prevalent. Um, and they're all filamentous and they all uh, usually will line up in some way or another if the issue is to study them with diffraction. So cylindrical averaging, what do I mean? Uh, I think it's fairly obvious, really. You've got your, um, if you have a crystalline, there's different types of fiber, right? You can have crystalline fibers, right? So where basically, uh, and uh, you know, there's, in DNA, you get crystalline forms of DNA, you get semi-crystalline forms of DNA. The X-shaped pattern I showed you earlier is what you'd call a semi-crystalline pattern. So you saw streaks making up that X-shaped pattern, uh, which uh, were actually close to continuous Fourier transform. There's very little sharp spots there, but it was very well defined in terms of the layer lines uh, you see in, in the pattern. But in some cases you can get, uh, I mean, I said, you know, we weren't talking about single crystals here. We're not talking about single crystals, but sometimes the, the crystalline blocks will form. Uh, they're microcrystalline blocks. They don't grow big into a normal single crystal, but you, you get um, small blocks which are interconnected by molecules going between the, the crystal blocks uh, and they are they all are lined up for the reasons we've just talked about 
uh, but randomly oriented about the axes where they're lined up. Um, so uh, in the case of a crystalline fiber, uh, the, polymer, the polymer molecules, are, they form these small crystallites, uh, one axis aligned along the fiber axis, uh, no preferred orientation normally about that axis. Um, and so what you get in terms of diffraction is a bit like what you could imagine getting if you had a single crystal and you just continuously rotated it around one of its principal axes during an experimental data collection, all right? So it's cylindrically averaged, uh, which means that some reflections, if you think about it, um, uh, which in a single crystal pattern would not, uh, would be symmetrically be related, um, but which could be observed separately, overlap when you rotate about that axis. So you'll have, you know, for example, I don't know, it depends on the symmetry, but you might have the bar two, one, and the two, the two, one or something, they might, you might expect that when that you rotate them around the principal axis, they would overlap and form in the same space. So you've got to think about all of the different multiplicities and, and, and things um, in, in analyzing these patterns. So that's the crystalline fiber. And then, uh, there's a non-crystalline, you can get non-crystalline fibers as well, where literally you don't think about crystalline blocks at all. You just think of rod-shaped molecules, if you like, that don't associate in any regular way, but which are randomly dis randomly translated along beside each other. And that's where you get something more like the semi-crystalline pattern we saw for DNA. Uh, you don't have sharp spots and you have something more closely relating to what I would call continuous Fourier transform along layer lines. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? You must stop me if I, if I don't make sense. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been done. Uh, so just to give you a feeling there, what for, when I say um, non-crystalline and crystalline, uh, on the left is what I've shown you before. It's actually a different type of sample, but uh, 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 that's the semi-crystalline form. So you can see these streaks along. So vertically is along here. This is what I would call a, a layer line, uh, layer planes, if you like. Uh, and uh, so you have intensity sort of in streaks and, and not in sharp spots. When you can persuade it to crystallize, it looks like this. So you get sharp spots, but you have this cylindrical averaging, which means that for every one spot, there may be a multiplicity of four or uh, 12 or two or something, depending on which part of the crystal lattice we're talking about. So that's the crystalline B form of DNA on the right. And there's the semi-crystalline, non-crystalline, if you like, form of DNA, B, B DNA on the left. So that's sort of cylindrical averaging. And, uh, you know, you can, here's a, a graphical way of, um, of describing it. Um, and uh, so, so the circles on the left-hand diagram, so your, 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 your reciprocal space, if you're at your reciprocal lattice, is represented by that square picture there with all the various lattice points. And then the circles are designed to represent uh, what, uh, you know, the way in which the cylind cylindrical averaging can be thought of. Uh, and, uh, and there's the e wall construction on the right. Uh, the central, um, line in the middle of the diffraction pattern is traditionally called the equator. So if we go back to here, the equator is the horizontal line in this, uh, in this diagram or in this diagram. And then the vertical line up here, up this axis, where you have all sorts of observations that you can relate to helical symmetry, is called the meridian. Uh, so you've got the equator horizontally and the meridian vertically. Uh, so and that's what's referred to in this diagram here, uh, vertically and horizontally. Um, so and then so I've mentioned here that when you rotate, you might get um, overlap, for example, of systematic reflections. Uh, actually, systematic reflections are usually uh, OK because you can divide by a multiplicity or something and, and account for it. Unless, of course, they're systematic reflections and they're not equal um, for a particular symmetry. Uh, in which case you, you have to refine against a compound observation. So, uh, and then I mentioned accidental overlap and accidental overlap is, is a sort of a strange term, but it means basically um, that they're not systematically related. I mean, like you take, you take for example, this, this crystal here, this representation of the crystal lattice or reciprocal lattice, um, 
then you could some reflections like the 001 and the uh, 00 bar one uh, would probably overlap and they might be of equal intensity, but you might get some that are very close to each other, which are not systematically related, but which start to overlap. And then that's a bit of a nightmare uh, to disentangle that. Or again, you may have to work with a compound observation um, for close reflections. So if you, again, if we just go back to here you are, if you imagine, so they're one of those spots will have many components but some of them are very close together uh, uh, and, and they have to be disentangled somehow. Uh, anyway, so there we go. Uh, and um, yes, so, so uh, and that's again, the, the sort of, um, this is a PPTA, uh, it's actually uh, Kevlar. Uh, this is a, so this is the, the fashion pattern of Kevlar, uh, very, very sharp spots, uh, some, uh, spots which will have you know a systematic overlap of course all of them will have systematic overlap and some will jay very close uh, that will be as it were accidentally overlapping so uh now this is where i've got um uh i, ha I have some equations and I, I i i wouldn't i don't want to label these too much because there isn't really enough time um but uh, for those for those of you that have done diffraction theory um it's, it's an attempt to, to summarize it in the case of helical diffraction. I'm not sure if the symbols are going to come out very well here because I haven't checked them. They were okay. But basically, you can think of, um, of a helix being made, made up um, as, as a convolution of a single term uh, with an, a, a, a point lattice uh, having dimensions of the pitch length. So you may have to take one turn and then you repeat that several times vertically, which is the uh, um, the pitch length repeated. Uh, and you can work out all of this theory. You always do it in cylindrical, you tend to do it in cylindrical polar um, uh, coordinates. Uh, and you, you, you basically, what you're trying to do is to work out uh, the Fourier transform of your object. That's what you're always trying to do with diffraction. Um, so Fourier transform of the object, as I say, it really doesn't matter whether you, you're into this theory or you're not. Um, and so all of these calculations just relate to the evaluation of that equation. And so we start off, trying to work out the, this product here, r dot s in, this, um, yeah, um, uh, in, in, in that equation, and you do it in cylindrical coordinates for one turn of a helix, and you've got it. That's the equation you come up with. I'm not going to labor it. I could suddenly go through it if anybody who's interested. Um, and, and p is the pitch of the helix. Uh, and, uh, and we're just thinking here of an idealized single helix. It's a wire. We don't have any atoms in it in this sort of concept. It's just, just a wire. Or we want the Fourier transform of that wire, and um, so you can you you work it all out and you get this type of thing, and uh, so uh, and that's all based on on um, uh, you, you, we think about an infinite helix, uh, and it can be thought of as I said as as a convolution of a single turn of the helix with a point that is having a spacing of p, where p is the pitch. So you, you make up these concepts, and then of course, if, if you remember the convolution theorem, you can relate the Fourier transforms of each of those components as the product. Uh, and, uh, and, and what what that tells you in the end is that the, uh, the, the Fourier transform of the, of the single turn uh, is, uh, it gives you a set of planes uh, having a, a, a spacing of one over the pitch. So everything is reciprocal space, that's what it's all about. So you work it all out. Um, and uh, the point I want to get to without laboring all of this is that it ends up being a set of Bessel functions, uh, this Fourier transform um, thing. Uh, and, uh, I, and then I just want to bring you back to um, the DNA because if, if you just, you go through all that theory and you work out the Bessel functions and I don't know if you, how, how many of you will know about best functions, but they're very simple. They're a little bit like damped sinusoidal um, functions. Uh, and this is a J0. Most of the Bessel functions, one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they start at zero and they have bumps like this. Uh, and uh, as you go, so this is a, a zeroth order Bessel function at the bottom. Uh, you have a first order Bessel function, second order Bessel function, third order, et cetera, et cetera. Now just look at the peaks there, right? They go further and further out as you go up higher and higher order vessel functions. And that's what I want you to compare to the DNA diffraction pattern, because you will notice that that's uh, exactly what happens in the DNA diffraction pattern. And that's why it becomes an X shape, um, uh, because every successive peak 
in the DNA pattern occurs further and further out as uh, radially. Uh, and uh, in the case of the zero thought of vessel function, you have a massive peak at the origin, uh, which doesn't really concern us too much. Well, it does actually, um, but at the very origin, it doesn't because we can't see the very origin because it's behind the beam stop. Anyway, so, so this is the, these are the vessel functions. Uh, they, um, uh, the, the maximum, first maximum occurs at progressively larger uh, radius or X in this diagram, and they have gradually diminishing magnitude with uh, as you go further and further out and further and further up. And I hope I've got a picture here. There we are. So, so that's sort of um, what uh, I was trying to say. And of course, you can relate that type of diffraction pattern to, to uh, the DNA one. Uh, so this is the zero layer line. I call that the equator a minute ago. This is the first layer line here, second layer line, third layer line, and the space in between the layer lines is uh, is related to the pitch, the one over the pitch. And so here you can see this very dark spot. Uh, if we go back to our zeroth order vessel function, it's in here, right? That's why it's so strong, because that vessel function there is this zeroth order vessel function. It's it's coming in about there. So uh, the, the, the general points are that the transform is restricted to layer lines, given um, here, given the symbol L, uh, and that it's cylindrically symmetric. So you could rotate your sample, uh, and it, that sample would not change at all. Um, there are exceptions to that, but um, that's the thing. Uh, so then you say, OK, that's a continuous helix, and we've roughly related it to the case of DNA. But of course, our helix is not really, um, um, uh, it's not really um, a discontinuous one. It's got things in it. It's got repeating units in it. It's got the base pair nucleotide uh, as, as a repeat, if it's DNA, they have a base pair nucleotide, which is here represented as, this, uh, as these dots. So let's just think of them as individual atoms because once we can do it for an atom, we can add together all the contributions to multiple atoms and, 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 and um, uh, and uh, and deal with it in in a, in, a, in a more simple way. So uh, along the axis, then you have this repeating unit, which we has a distance of h. In the case of DNA, of course, that repeating that distance would be uh, three point four angstroms for a pitch of ten uh, to of thirty four angstrom pitch, ten base pairs per turn. Uh, um, and so, uh, so in the end, you can think about this again if you. Forget this if you're not into the, into the, uh, the, the, the physics or the mass, uh, but you can think of the uh, of this as, as a convolution of the Fourier transform of an infinite helix with the Fourier transform of a set of planes spaced by this distance h. And so you can work through that type of theory. And what that theory uh, tells you is, uh, glossing over it a bit, is that you would get as you went vertically up the axis in your diffraction space, you would get a repeating x shape pattern every one over h, every at, at a repeating period of distance of, of one over h. There's a thing called uh, the helical selection rule, which tells you which vessel function uh, contributes to which layer line and how they overlap and, 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 uh, and, uh, and cause the diffraction pattern. So you end up with this expression here. The vessel functions and, and uh, the the sum over all of the uh, the different vessel function systems. Now, in practice, you don't. It depends on your symmetry, but in practice, you don't see a uh, huge number. In, in the case of DNA, you only see one of these extra X-shaped patterns. Uh, that's the one over H. That's the three point four reflection, if you like here, uh, and you can see uh, a shoulder coming down a bit, and and obviously in the center you see the main one. Um, but they peg out as you go further out in resolution, like all diffraction pegs out as you go further and further into higher resolution. So there you are. There's back to the DNA reference, uh, your X-shaped pattern, your second X-shaped pattern, which corresponds to the discontinuous helix. And then you can see the shoulders coming off that there. And of course, you can imagine you've got vessel functions corresponding to each of these layer lines. And then you have other vessel functions coming in from the next. Uh, X shape pattern, if you like, overlapping with the first set. And you have to sum all that together 
in, in calculating the diffraction pattern um, for designing a target function for refinement. So uh, that's uh, that's supposed to be a representation of um, of uh, a different uh, different uh, you know different, the, the helical diffraction in a very very nutshell form, uh, having skipped over most of the equation stuff. Uh, and these are these are other examples which show you the complexity of of uh, of patterns when the, all of these so to all of these examples here you see it's all streaks there's no crystalline sampling whatsoever so these are all it's all molecular transform and and no sampling and you can see here there's there's a there's a the, the second order uh, the second um, set of Bessel functions here starting to overlap with the first set of Bessel functions and and so on so you can see all these things I'm not going to go into the, the details of indexing it but uh, you can see how the systems start to overlap with each other and you get quite complex things going on. Right, now, uh, just to extend that a tiny bit further, obviously we're, we're not talking about a monomer uh, that has one atom, we're talking about a monomer that has several atoms, as, as in the case of DNA, it's a nucleotide, um, a nucleotide-based pair, and you have several atoms. So you have to sum over the contributions for all of those atoms uh, and, um, and and in the case of X-rays, we know we have the atomic scattering factor, which is F in this equation. Uh, and that has a, a certain form that you will probably know from other things. Uh, depends on the number of electrons, depends which atom it is in the periodic table. And the form of this <coughs> is identical for neutrons, except for the fact that your atomic X-ray atomic scattering factor is replaced by your neutron scattering length. Um, and that's the only difference, really. Uh, but the calculation is otherwise exactly the same. Now, we don't need to dwell on the calculations, um, but that's just an introduction. This is an old slide, right? You can tell that it's old because somehow old slides um, seem to be more yellow, even though the technology is still digital. But anyway, it's an old slide, and I was actually taking, there was one, there was a, I had a technician on, on, on the instrument I, I worked on for a while, and, and he had a, a, he used to take me out uh, in his, Plane. And so that was a picture I took years ago. And um, anyway, X-rays and neutrons, that's what I was leading to with this equation here. And um, uh, and that's the sort of the real life aspect of it, the X-rays and the neutrons and the river. Uh, so that's the ILL. I, 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 you know, I showed you these pictures yesterday. Uh, EMBL, um, the synchrotron and so on. And here it is, here's the scattering sort of summary. Um, if you think of, uh, the scattering I've mentioned, you know, the subatomic scattering factor, the neutron scattering lengths. If you think of the X-ray case, um, you don't need to worry about the two two lines, um, but just say take the second one. As you go up in atomic weight, your scattering amplitude goes up as well. So at the very extreme end, you've got hydrogen practically invisible, all the way uh, up to um, to to the higher atomic weights where everything goes. Uh, uh, if everything scatters strongly. And in the case of the neutrons, uh, as you go up the periodic table, it looks like it's just random, actually. Uh, but at this end, obviously, we've got hydrogen and its isotope deuterium, that's important. And then uh, more or less of equal uh, amplitude are most of the elements of biological systems and biomaterials, um, you know, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and so on, uh, with a few exceptions like sulfur and things which are a bit different. Anyway, so that's supposed to be a representation there, and you've probably seen this slide many times. Uh, you have uh, x-rays and neutrons. Every, every time I copy this presentation into another file, it seems to change the colors randomly. But anyway, so so x-rays, neutrons, uh, you're, you're, you're scattering proportional to z in the one case, and neutrons not proportional, and then you've got, these are just random examples, and then, of course, you've got in the case of uh, of um, neutrons, you've got the isotopic replacement of H by D, uh, and that's a huge effect, right? So, as I said yesterday, uh, negative scattering length for um, for hydrogen, positive scattering length um, for deuterium, and that shouldn't be thought of about negative scattering. There's no such thing as negative scattering. Um, you, uh, what it relates to is actually phase of, of the scattered wave in relationship to the instant phase. Uh, so, but nonetheless, the, in, the, in the density maps, you will, um, the negative peaks 
will, uh, the, the negative scattering length will give you negative peaks in the map. Um, and that can cause difficulties. You place it all by deuterium and it makes uh, much easier. But you can see, you know, how that compares. That's sort of hydrogen then becomes similar scattering power to carbon, uh, oxygen. Uh, they're all sort of in the same ballpark, really. Um, so that's the X ray. Now, I'm not going to go into the incoherent scattering cross sections because uh, I think we talked about incoherent, and I suspect Frank and others will, will have mentioned this. But the only thing to take away from that. Is, is this is supposed to represent the incoherent scattering from uh, hydrogen versus um, deuterium, right? So you can see the, the, the massive difference here, um, hydrogen, hydrogen, deuterium, uh, and uh, that's very significant. And I tried to explain that yesterday in terms of the background that you saw and that restricted the, uh, the, the, um, the measurement of the Bragg spots in your crystallographic experiments. Um, and the other thing uh, to remember is that uh, if you look at this sort of X-ray scattering, and I, I can't remember what that is, uh, that carbon, I suppose, uh, the X-ray scattering factor uh, as a function of angle, you know, the patch pattern, or uh, uh, as you go out in the scattering angle, uh, it falls off. The X-ray scattering factor falls off uh, um, as a function of scattering angle, um, and and the reason for that, of course, is that your electron cloud is is of the same order of magnitude as the wavelength of the radiation you're using uh, to probe it. Uh, so let's just say your wavelength is one angstrom or one and a half angstrom, and your 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 atoms are in that ballpark, right? So you have an object. Uh, and this comes back to sort of Fourier transforms again. If you have the larger your object, the more quickly the the uh, the the the, the, uh, the Fourier transform will will um, will fall off. But in the case of neutrons, the neutron the nucleus is is essentially minuscule compared to the wavelength of the neutron beam, which would be about the same as an X-ray beam wavelength, uh, and so it doesn't fall off at all. So it's a straight line. So in principle, you, there's your neutron scattering um, um, length. And it just goes on. It, it of course it does fall off, but not on the scale that you can see on this um, on this diagram. And what that means is, although your neutrons uh, are high, uh, are low flux uh, compared to the X-rays, uh, massively um, the X-rays are massively more high flux than, than the neutrons. Um, uh, they, the, the the scattering uh, length doesn't really fall off. Uh, over the, the diffraction pattern you observe. And there may be some pictures uh, summarizing that um, later, I'm not sure of it. Uh, anyway, so these are some of the sort of summary uh, patterns, um, summary facts about X-rays and neutrons. Um, you know, typically, um, you know, you, you get various things there. You can get uh, high resolution with both, but uh, often, uh, your definitive molecular structures come from X-ray, small samples, time resolved data. You've got so much flux that you can watch things changing, and you um, and there are sample damage issues, of course, radiation damage, and then neutrons. Uh, you low resolution in solution contrast variation that you've seen, uh, high resolution crystallographic experiments where you see hydrogen, and then fiber diffraction, for example, water, hydrogen atoms, filamentous molecules, and so on. So that's an attempt, so, and dy dynamics, which is something, um, yeah, and, and no sound damage. Now, back to DNA, uh, the reference molecule. So on the left there, you see, um, just to bring the neutrons in, uh, the neutron fiber diffraction, could be uh, uh, putting it alongside the X-rays. Um, uh, 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 so you, on the left, you've got the X-ray uh, diffraction, fiber diffraction pattern of the, of the B form of DNA. And then on the right, I, I can't begin to describe how we actually did this experiment because it was so long, so hard, and the sample was so hard, everything was hard about it. But anyway, on, on, on the right, you see the same sample, same type of sample, obviously much bigger because it was neutrons, a bigger sample, um, hydrated in H2. And then what's all that's happened here? So when you do DNA, uh, you you may remember from you know, the history books or papers and stuff that you have to keep the, the sample humid, right? Because it's a water-loving molecule, it's phosphate and charge, and you know it 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 it, it, it thrives. Uh, it, it 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 likes water. 
So, and then of course, what you what you had to do in studying it was to bring the humidity uh, to a particular value that optimized um, the quality of the diffraction pattern. And actually that was the way you induced conformational change as well. So when you did experiments, you were always recording um, data in a, in a humidity chamber and you were always recording data in the presence of H2O. And the whole idea of the initial experiments we did on DNA with neutrons was we were just doing a simple thing of replacing the H2O in the environment by D2O. And so you can see there uh, what happened when we did that. And I, I say this was a, most in, a big task. It was, I mean, if you look at these pictures, you'll see strips in there. And those strips reflect the size of the detector. So in comparison to the situation with X-rays, where we were just getting all in one shot on one detector, we had to record uh, individual strips for the entire diffraction pattern, uh, moving the detector around and so on, uh, and then assemble the whole thing into a contiguous image uh, that gave you these patterns. And on the left, you see the neutron pattern uh, with the DNA hydrate in H2O, and on the right, you see the neutron diffraction pattern recorded in D2O, and the difference is huge. And that is solely attributable, uh, as you can see, all over the, all over the diffraction pattern, everything changes. And that is solely attributable to the water that's located around the DNA in a structured way, structured water around DNA. Uh, and that was what we were after at the time. So now I come to this, I, I, I don't know whether my movies, now they're not gonna cooperate. Oh, maybe they are, um, maybe not. Anyway, I wish I could show you that because it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, anyway, I come back. So neutrons, X-rays, uh, you see all the things there, um, and uh, uh, and and I'm just going to sort of summarize that some of the things uh, you see um, when you try to uh, change DNA forms, right? So on the left hand side, the, on, a, on on in the middle, we've got the B form of DNA, and and this was a, for a very particular a repetitive sequence DNA. It wasn't random sequence DNA. It wasn't calf dimers DNA. It wasn't summoned sperm DNA. It was a, a, a very uh, particular alternating 18 sequences, which actually are quite important in, in biology, bi biological, uh, in, in DNA function and structure. Um, and but anyway, the 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 the, the, the aspect of of, the, of repetitive se of this repetitive sequence of DNA that's striking is that it gives you a completely different form of DNA called dDNA which you don't see in single crystals, but you can obviously see it's highly crystalline from, from, from this pattern. It, instead of having um, uh, 10, 10 base pairs per turn, it actually has eight base pairs per turn. And, um, and anyway, so you can get this thing to change between uh, the two forms uh, and by just altering the humidity in the sample. And this was a movie. It was supposed to be a movie, curse it. Um, but it shows the thing going between one and the other. And that was, Totally using the uh, the high high the high flux of, of the synchrotron to be able to follow this thing in time real mode. Um, so I mean, if I if we ever have a chance to talk again about this, I, I can certainly dig out those movies. So you can see they're very they're very spectacular. So that's one example of transitions: exploiting X-ray, exploiting flux, using uh, being being able to do time resolved work, and that's of course a massive. I mean, actually. To, I'm probably going on about this, but the other the other famous fibrous molecule that actually drove synchrotron radiation into the, into full exploitation was muscle, because all of the people in the early days um, of the, they were all after X-ray flux in the early days. That there was the crystallographers uh, trying to solve all these amazing proteins, Dorothy Hodgkin, all these people that are doing amazing things, Dixie uh, Phillips, and, and but then alongside those guys, there, were, there was a huge interest in trying to understand the contractile cycle of muscle. And that's where they wanted muscle, they wanted flux. Uh, that's how rotating anodes became, came onto the scene after fixed anode systems. Um, and that's how the, how the first synchrotron radiation sources were propelled. They weren't actually propelled, I don't think, by, by, by what you might assume now, which is the, the, the sort of protein crystallography. They were propelled by um, by muscle, and then of course, once the muscle thing, the, and the muscle was hard, right? you've got to get to millisecond resolution to look at the um, muscle contractile cycle. Um, but then obviously the crystallography took off as well. So the history is interesting um, of all of that, and it, but it probably wouldn't have happened in the same way without muscle. Uh, anyway, there's another one here that I, I mentioned, 
don't know how that's gone wrong that slide, but anyway, um, uh, there, there's, a, there's one left-handed form. All the DNA forms apart from one is, is, is uh, left-handed, is right-handed. Uh, but the Z DNA is left-handed. That was actually first discovered in a single crystal uh, study. Uh, and, and you can get, this is the intriguing thing, you can get uh, right-handed B, uh, B DNA um, turning into left-handed Z DNA um, with, with 12 base pairs per turn. So completely different stereochemistry, completely different geometry. And these pictures on the right, which seem to have been mucked up a bit, um, are sequences from the, uh, uh, the diffraction sequence recorded as it goes uh, from one form to the other. In this particular case, which involved methylated DNA, 5-methyl cytosine, uh, it's the one way. Once you've gone into the into the Z form, you can't get out of it again. So it's trapped probably by the methyl group going around and obscuring um, its return. So anyway, so I just make these points uh, uh, about the, the time resolved aspect of it. And coming back to the, the, the neutrons as well, I we, we sort of used these differences between uh, the D2O based um, uh, DNA work and, and the H2O uh, DNA um, data to work to do Fourier analysis of where the water was going. Uh, and we get pictures like this. Um, now this is, you know, it's a different sort of thing from, it, it, it does follow, the analysis follows fairly uh, crystal, crystallographic patterns, but uh, what, so what you see here are very, very clearly uh, structured water um, patterns uh, in two different forms of DNA. So this is the D form of DNA. You've got very highly structured water going down the um, minor group of the, of the helix. And then the A form, is, it's the opposite. It's the major group and you've got these regular water bridges formed as you go down, but linking the phosphate oxygens. So water driving the transitions, X-rays watching the transitions and neutrons telling you what the water is doing is sort of the bottom line there. Now I realize I'm going on in time, but I wanted to at least let you know, um, let you see some of the, I, I, yesterday I, I showed you a diffraction pattern uh, where I simulated the consequences of hydrogen incoherent scattering uh, and the background and the visibility of the spots and so on. And this is one of the, things that uh, you can also see in the DNA. Uh, this is a neutron experiment where you start off uh, in 100% H2O. So again, look at that background. So the coherence of these spots here, I don't know what you can see in your screen, but you see some dark spots there, which are actually the coherent diffraction from the DNA. Uh, and then this background stuff is the incoherent, the dark stuff. Um, and what we did was we simply changed the uh, supply of vapor around the sample from H2O to D2O, and we watched it change. Um, and as you did that, you see the background change. Um, hope you can see that. Uh, and um, so you, your visibility uh, uh, improves massively. Uh, I'll go, just go through it again. Uh, there you go, D2O replacing H2O. Background improving, uh, signal to noise of the days you're after improving as well. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, and then the, these are sort of comparisons. Um, and now I made these points, this was all DNA that had not been deuterated. Um, so although we were talking about replacing the solvent around it by um, H2O by D2O, there's still all of, the, all of the hydrogens left covalently attached to the DNA itself, to the sugar groups, for example, uh, some on the bases, uh, because this was not DNA grown in, in deuterated media. It was just DNA in which the solvent had been replaced through vapor exchange in, in the environment of the sample. Uh, but if you look at that DNA molecule, and I hope this picture works, right, these are all of the ones. Uh, so this is ADNA, for example, with, without uh, uh, hydrogen. And then here, are, these are, are the hydrogen atoms that remain to be replaced and which you can replace if you then grow your DNA in, uh, you grow cells in, uh, for example, coli cells, you can grow them in deuterated media and then you can extract the, the DNA from that and then you have deuterated DNA. So that's a summary of the coherent and incoherent diffraction. Um, and I think I'm probably going to uh, 
uh, stop there before I get on to contrast variation because I think Frank has probably covered Frank uh, um, contrast variation and I think I'm already at 55 minutes is that am I right Tommy are we yeah it's fine to okay. stop there and take some questions I think yeah sure so is there any questions for Trevor Jennifer has raised her hand, I see. Hi, uh, I was just wondering with the, the changing in the um, changing from D2O uh, to H2O or the other direction, um, obviously there's always kind of the concern that the uh, structure of your sample actually changes um, <laughs> when you go between them. How much would you say that's actually an issue and does it vary so depending on what you're looking at? Yeah, so you're talking about basically an isotope effect. Yeah. Yeah, so no, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the um, and you should always be thinking about this, whether you're doing it in solutions or whether you do it with piss oil or whatever it is, you should always be, and, and I would say in particular, I would, you would need to be a little bit, you have to be careful about lipids. Uh, in fact, if you use red lipids and so on. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, yes, so, so the, but, but what we do anyway, let's just say we're looking at a, at a, a we have a deuterate structure, we have a hydrogenated structure, and we want to be sure that they're okay. So what we always do is just use x-rays. We do the x-ray structures of both. Uh, and that would be this case, whether you did it with DNA, your, 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 your deuterated stuff and your non-deuterated stuff, you, you, you want to compare. Now, what, what we find is that for mostly that the structures are closely comparable and not always, every now and then there is a problem. Um, but uh, what shifts, so just to take, come back to DNA, which has been the reference for all of this, uh, which is sort of good. Um, if, you, if you follow conformational transitions, if you take random sequence DNA, it goes to a, a sequence called, it goes from C to A to B as a function of humidity. That, that, that's the transition. And that is highly, highly, the humidities at which that occurs is highly dependent on salt content. And what we found was that in the case of produce-rated DNA, or everything replaced, that the 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 the, it, the, 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 the um, deuterated stuff occurred at different salt concentrations. So the transition shifted in terms of ionic strength, and that probably comes back to deuterium and electronegativity and all sorts of things that I really don't know is well understood. Um, but it's uh, it's extremely interesting. But you're absolutely right. You have to. If you're in this business, you have to constantly do these checks. Uh, and it, it, mostly for us, what we do is we check cross check with the x rays. Okay. There is uh, another comment from Susanna. It was. Um, yes, I have a question. So, for the DNA studies, is it a synthetic DNA or you extracted it from bacteria or something? Uh, both. So, well, there was a whole lot of different things. Um, so, uh, the the one I just referred to uh, with Jennifer, it, that, that I was referring to random, what we call, what we used to call random sequence DNA, which is natural DNA that might be extracted from calf thymus or salmon sperm or clostridium perfringens or something. Uh, 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 but in, when I referred to the D form of DNA, that was a synthetic DNA alternating AT sequences. I, somewhere I have a diagram, but it summarizes DNA polymorphism, which is incredible. So, but so the D form, it's only observed for uh, alternating AT. Uh, and the one where I mentioned the Z form, the, or the Z form, as the Americans will say, uh, is actually alternating GC. And um, the interesting thing there is that um, uh, it was methylated. I mean, so you methylate DNA. If you have size to see methylation, which is associated with transcription effects, uh, the behavior shifts, but you still have this left-handed form. Uh, so so in, in the data I showed you, there was a combination of synthetic and natural sequence. Okay, and how long are those DNAs? Like how many base pairs? Oh, tens of thousands of base pairs. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so you, if you multiply by 3.4, it's huge. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Into the microns. Oh, so maybe I can ask another one. Um, so do you try to deuterate DNA, but like short sequence DNA, like 100 base pairs? Uh, sorry, just say, say again. 
Uh, if you manage to deuterate DNA, but like yep. short DNA, like for instance, 100 base pairs or even less. You're, you're asking me, could you or? or if or... someone did it, because I tried to do this and I failed. So I had a complex protein DNA and my uh -huh. DNA, it's, no, it's 60 base pairs. Oh, I see. So short, short oligos you're talking about. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah so... Um... Uh, yes, well, obviously you can, but but you what you have got to get hold of um, is if you want to deuterate it, uh, um, and then what you've got to get hold of, hold of is you've got to get you've got to find somebody who's got a, 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 a an oligonucleotide synthesizer and get hold of the deuterated phosphoramidites that are that you have to feed into that synthesizer in order to get your deuterated stuff. So it's a little bit non-trivial, um, and you need uh, and we've got a uh, a little bit of a project going on at the moment with the with the Surrey Quantum Biology Center where there is a student who's trying to do exactly this to produce the uh, synthetically produce the deuterated phosphoramidites for DNA crystal. Uh, but yes, it's a pain. It's an absolute pain. Um, it's not something I mean we were doing it in, if you like, it wasn't easy, but what we were doing was deuterated stuff from coli cells, then phenol extraction and um, purification of polymeric DNA not the same as what you're talking about where you want presumably a rather specific sequence that's 60 yeah. base pairs long or something um so yeah it, it's it's something that needs to be developed i would say yeah because we are thinking um with anthony Duff from anstor oh yeah yeah just to do this in e coli so we had a yeah. synthetic plasmid and then we put the um yeah. like 20 repeats of the dna sequence Yes. And then just try to uh, like giga prep this. Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and and you, say, you say you started and you failed, or is this another idea? Sorry. You said, did you say that you had tried that and failed, or or, or what? So we actually we didn't manage because it was during Corona time. Oh, so, okay. so it failed. Yeah, yeah. Everything failed in Corona time. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. No, but it's, 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 it's a bit of a problem, and it would be it would be great. I've always, it's always something I felt that we should do is to develop. Um, the, the problem really is in the end that you know you if you run a DNA synthesizer, you you need sort of somebody dedicated more or less to run it. We we do peptide synthesis, um, but you run a DNA, and then you've got to get the the protected um, um, nucleotide things and. Um, yeah, it's it's just a bit of a kerfuffle, really, um, and then you've got to somehow keep it running, and um, so it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Maybe one day. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other uh, questions for Trevor? And Yeah. Um, a question about the alignment. Uh, I imagine that it's very important to have perfect alignment uh, of uh, uh, fibers. Or uh, well, you get. Uh, I'm, uh, you get. Um, I'm trying to um, think now. Um, uh, I. I have so many slides. No, I, I think uh, alignment is an issue. I mean, uh, some and obviously you never get perfect alignment uh, any more than you get a perfect crystal. Um, but um, and sometimes the alignment is dreadful for some systems, and sometimes it's very difficult to optimize, and sometimes it's unusable. Um, uh, so yes, it's a absolutely principal concern, and. Um, uh, but uh, you'll see that the DNA ones that those are pretty well aligned, um, and um, there's lots of cases where um, uh, alignment is very good, and uh, and so on. What's actually happened? What's happened? What we've done more recently, and I haven't, I've got data in that PowerPoint somewhere on it, but uh, is where we've been using the FEL at Stanford to shoot um, fibrillar particles through a jet. They line up in the jet through shear alignment. And then you do serial fiber diffraction on them, where in principle one pulse is hitting one particle, and then you're getting each of those crystallites in the crystalline diffraction pattern being separated. And then you can perfectly, or if you like the word perfect, um, because you can take each diffraction pattern and 
oriented, computationally data oriented, and then assemble the whole thing if you want to see what it looks like. And it looks beautiful, actually. So that's decomposing the fiber into its constituent contributions. So I, 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 I had I had a, an hour and a half, I would have got onto that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. I guess, Trevor, you have this special spinning device for the DNA stuff, or? Well, actually, uh, we do have it. Uh, it hasn't been used for a while. Uh, that's Adam, uh, Adam uh, Andrew Wilds uh, was the guy who, who, who was doing that. And I think it still exists, um, but he has moved off that. And, and uh, this came from Alan Ruprecht in, in Stockholm, I think, or Aarhus, I, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, he, he pioneered all of that. And it was, he, he used it for DNA, but he also used it for polysaccharides. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that was a pretty heroic thing he did, but it's sort of, it went, he passed it on to us in his retirement and, and Andrew um, has done a fair bit of it with Michelle Perra and other people. And um, so, uh, yes, we have it available, uh, but nobody actually um, has a project for it at the moment. Yeah. But that, that I remember as a quite an east uh, yeah, yeah. way to orient think. Thanks. Maybe I can uh, ask a last question. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I was just thinking about this um, coherent and incoherent scattering you showed. Like, so do you consider like the incoherent scattering at all or do you just like, to, can you get any other information from the incoherent scattering or is it just only a background? Yeah, that's going to be a really good, really good question. Um, uh, and the answer is uh, yes, in principle, if you have the right instrument, you can use incoherent scattering to get mean square displacement of the atoms causing it. And the dynamics guys will tell you that. I don't know if you have any dynamics lectures. Uh, I'm not really a dynamics person, but in principle, what happens is your, your, your hydrogen incoherent scattering as a function of the scattering angle falls off. Uh, and it will fall off more rapidly if your mean square displacement is low, then if it's, so you can, in principle, you can extract. Now, the problem with doing it in a diffraction experiment like that is that there's all sorts of contributions to that, like hot neutron and, and fast neutrons, and it's a complex. So you need to have a, 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 a more dedicated instrument that can measure um, the incoherent scattering. So there's definitely, it should not, the word noise is sometimes used. Um, uh, to describe incoherent scattering, and that's not not right. And the dynamics people will 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 throw a fit if you if, if you call it noise, uh, because for them it's their signal. Mm. Uh, so there's information there, uh, and uh, it can be exploited, uh, and uh, we shouldn't forget that either. The other thing is that in a in a in a wonderful um, a utopian world, you can use a magnetic field at low temperature to separate the spin states of hydrogen and completely eliminate hydrogen from scattering using that, but that's not easy. Yeah, and this was like maybe follow up question, like but then, then there is a difference between doing this in X-ray and neutrons, because we said that neutrons have like a stable um, amplitude, yes, with angle. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yes, exactly, 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 yes. 